Welcome back to another episode of Spilling Secrets, a podcast on all things related to trade secret and non-compete law. In today's episode, we will be discussing litigating physician non-compete cases. My name is Kate Rigby. I'm a partner with Epstein, Becker & Green's Boston office and one of the members of EBG's Health Employment and Labor Team, or HEAL. With me today are three of my partners, Eric Weibust, Jill Bigler, and Dan Fahey. Eric Weibus is also a partner in EBG's Boston office and a regular contributor to Spilling Secrets. He is one of the co-chairs of EBG's Trade Secret and Employee Mobility Practice Group and regularly represents physician practices and private equity firms that own them in litigation across the country. Jill Bigler is a partner in EBG's Columbus office, where she also regularly represents physician practices and private equity companies that own them in non-compete and employment litigation in Ohio and across the country. Dan Fahey is a partner in ABG's Chicago office, where he helps healthcare clients with strategic and operational matters, such as transactions, corporate governance, and regulatory compliance issues. Welcome, Eric, Jill, and Dan. Hey, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Good morning, Kate. So our regular listeners will recall that we recently released an episode on restrictive covenants in the healthcare industry, where we discuss the drafting and use of non-competes and other restrictive covenants in the healthcare industry. And we rolled out a 50-state healthcare supplement to EBG's 50-state non-compete survey, which is available for free on the firm's website. We received such good feedback about that last episode and the supplement that we thought it made sense to discuss a related issue, litigating physician non-compete cases. Now, many people know that lawyers cannot be bound by non-competes that restrict in any way their ability to practice law. And this is not because we make the laws. And in fact, There are no laws across the country um, that prohibit the use of non-competes with lawyers. Rather, every state has adopted an ethical rule for lawyers. The underlying reason for this rule is based on the sanctity of the attorney-client relationship and the idea that clients should be permitted to choose who represents them in important legal matters. The same, of course, can be said about physician-patient relationship, but in that industry, there are no rules prohibiting non-competes. As a result, in most states, physicians can be bound by non-competes assuming the non-compete provision, of course, otherwise meets particular requirements, which may vary from state to state. That said, due to the sanctity of the physician-patient relationship and the public policy in protecting that relationship, litigating physician non-competes has its own host of unique issues that are not necessarily present when litigating non-compete disputes in other industries, where the customer relationship, of course, is far more transactional. So, Jill, with that backdrop, let's begin discussing a little bit about this. While there's no nationwide rule or standard, several states treat physicians or other types of healthcare practitioners differently than other types of employees under the non-compete laws. Can you give our listeners some examples of states that do so? Sure, Kate. So currently, a little less than half of the states in the U.S. have statutes on the books that are going to apply to non-competes for healthcare providers. And within those statutes, it's going to vary as to the type of provider that's covered and the type of restriction that's present. So, for example, some states like Massachusetts have banned non-competes for physicians, nurses, psychologists, and social workers altogether. Oregon bans non-competes for home care workers and personal support workers but not any other healthcare provider. And then we have states like Colorado who have banned non-competes that restrict a physician's right to practice medicine, but permit non-competes outside of that context. So maybe as an administrator or director of an organization. And then you have states like Delaware that prohibit non-competes between or among physicians, but not between physicians and third parties. So you have that kind of backdrop of all of these statutes. But even in states where maybe there's not a statute that directly applies to healthcare providers, you've got common law that's going to come into play. So, for example, we've got North Carolina. Healthcare non-competes are permitted. There's no statute on the books. But case law has shown that courts tend to disfavor those based on public policy reasons. Again, we, we have this kind of patchwork of statutes and common law that are going to apply depending on what jurisdiction you're in. Even with these examples that Jill provided, and others that are all under a 50-state survey, most states still allow non-competes for physicians and other types of healthcare practitioners in the same way that they allow non-competes for any other type of employee. So, Eric, that said, have you seen courts treat the enforcement of non-competes differently when a physician or other healthcare practitioner is involved? Sure. So when we come to a litigation or deciding whether to file a litigation in this context, the agreement is what it is and the state law is what it is. And one of the first decisions we typically come across is whether or not to obtain or seek injunctive relief. And when you're seeking injunctive relief, of course, you're you're operating under the court's equity power, which means they can consider equitable factors such as fairness and public policy. 
And one of the factors in many states for obtaining an injunction is that court has to consider the public policy. And of course, one of the elements of enforceability of any non-compete is that it has to be reasonable in scope. With all of that in mind, when you go to the court and ask for an injunction and the person you're trying to stop from working or at least stop from working in a particular area is a physician or a nurse or some other frontline healthcare worker, all of these factors come into play. And, and depending on the geography, a court may consider the geographic restriction to be overbroad, even if it's two miles, if you're in a city, for example, whereas in a more rural area, 40 or 50 miles may be acceptable. But on top of that, and you see that in any industry, but on top of that, you've also got to layer in the fact that this may be the only physician of that specialty in a particular area. You probably see less of that in a city and more of that in a rural area. Even if you have a smaller 20 mile, say, restriction in a rural area, the court may still say that's too broad because we don't have this particular specialty in this area. Therefore, I'm not going to issue an injunction putting this physician out of work or making them move 20, 30, 40 miles away, but you can still pursue a claim for damages if you're able to prove that. You're just not going to get the injunctive relief you're seeking. That said, there's obviously other types. Even if you face that situation, the courts are still likely to enforce a non disclosure agreement, certainly. And to some degree, customer, in this case, patient non-solicits, probably less so for non-acceptance. You know, if a patient comes to you, the doctor, whether or not you can provide them with services, but it's very different than your typical industry or salesperson or even engineer where the customer relationship is very transactional and, and not so personal as you'd see in, in this context. So, Dan, you were previously in-house counsel for a major health system, and now you focus your practice on health care regulatory and transactional issues. Can you discuss some of the factors that employers in this space might consider when deciding whether to pursue litigation against a departing physician with non-compete obligations? Certainly. And I think a lot of the factors are not too distinct from what you might see in other sectors, whether it be the financial industry or other areas, tech industry. With respect to healthcare, and we've talked about it, but obviously there's a lot of public policy around patient needs. So there's definitely reputational harm if you're going to be pursuing a physician for violating a non-compete agreement. The physician world, like any other sector, is close. And I think that hospitals, clinics, and other providers are concerned if they're perceived as pursuing physicians that may breach their non-compete obligation. I think that especially comes into play depending on the geographic area, as Eric talked about earlier, rural markets are competing for physicians. It's extremely competitive. Their greatest needs are specialties. So if they're known for going after people for violating it, it may hurt the recruiting efforts when they're trying to get someone to come and invest in that community. I think the other piece of it is somewhat the investment. Obviously, there's various types of providers. It can be an academic medical center. It can be a nonprofit hospital. It can be a for-profit hospital. But if there's been a significant investment in a specialty or building up a team around them, there may be more incentive that this person really spurned us like anything. There might be emotion involved. But on the pure healthcare and kind of in the provider hospital space, it's less on the regulatory issues in terms of health regulatory issues. There's always going to be obligations that come into mind. You need to be able to make sure patients have access to care. You need to make sure that their medical records are available to them. But a lot of the considerations are very similar to what you might see in other industries. Yeah, those are such good points. Eric and Jill, I'm, I'm curious, have you had similar conversation with your physician practice clients? Absolutely. I think there's really not a one-size-fits-all approach that clients can take to these situations. It's really a case-by-case -case assessment of the facts and the circumstances surrounding a departing physician or other provider. First and foremost, we want to take a look at what's the legitimate business interest that we're trying to protect here. How likely are we going to be able to enforce this agreement? Courts are more likely to enforce a non-compete if there's confidential information or trade secrets that have been taken. As Dan alluded to, what's the investment here? Have we provided that provider with significant training or access to a patient base? Those are all things that, you know, maybe would cause us to want to enforce that agreement um, in that situation. But again, on top of what's the legitimate business interest, we also want to take a look at 
what's the harm, potential harm to the employee, what's the potential harm to the public. As Eric said and Dan both said, there's a public policy bent to all of this a little bit more than other industries. And so, you know, what is the scope of that non-compete? Is it is it overbroad? What's the specialty? Are we are we prohibiting within that particular specialty? Or are we prohibiting all competition? So analyzing all of these factors to determine, is this the best case to try to enforce? Do we have legitimate reasons? I mean, as we all know, non-compete litigation can get expensive very, very quickly for our clients. And so that is also always something we we think about in the background. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with Jill. And I suspect we've had um, several of these conversations with these clients together. The only thing I would add is that these physician practices, in my experience, and the owners truly do care about the patients. And so far more than any other industry, you're having the conversation about the effect on the, in this case, the patient, but generally the customer. If you're selling widgets or something, you're less concerned about whether the customer is going to get a specific type of widget. But when you're talking about patients and relationships, these folks do really care. And so it is a, a much bigger conversation in this context than others in my experience. It's very different than, than <laughs> and maybe other litigation where you might get a client involved. Certainly not the case in these, this type of litigation. So Dan, there's been a lot of consolidation in the healthcare industry over the past few years. Can you explain how that consolidation is changing the ownership structure of physician practices from a single practice, perhaps owned by a few physicians, to larger portfolios of physician practices owned by a single entity or a group of investors? Certainly. I think there's three buckets in terms of the consolidation when it comes to physicians and kind of the general provider market. One, there's been a lot of hospital consolidation. So hospitals have merged and it used to be maybe within a metropolitan area. It was two hospitals coming together. But now we're seeing mergers across states with large systems. So that has kind of shifted the landscape for physicians. And along the same lines, the second one has been physicians are now, at least in the healthcare context, the ones that are at hospitals are largely employed by the hospital. Previously, there's a lot of private groups that would staff hospitals. They would have privileges to practice there. And a lot of times they were private groups that had an exclusive arrangement with that hospital. So they could be the only anesthesiology group that staffed that hospital and that allowed them to have greater control. But the greatest change that we've seen in recent years has been with respect to private equity and other investment interests into physician practices. And that spans a lot of different specialties, dermatology, anesthesiology, all across the board. And what was previously could have been a professional practice owned by one or two um, MDs, it can now, you are getting private equity investment. And there's a state restriction called the corporate practice of medicine, which prohibits lay people from owning a physician practice. A number of states have this restriction, meaning me as a lawyer, Dan Fahey, I can't own a physician practice because the public policy interest is that physicians are in the best position to own it because they're not motivated by the business interest. They're motivated by the belt well-being of the patients. But there's been a friendly PC arrangement whereby there's one PC that might buy a physician practice, and then they enter into a series of management agreements with a management company that might have private equity-backed interests. And that has changed a great deal. And it's what was previously could have been mom and pop practices now have are just one uh, roll up under a very large portfolio or very large platform. And it's extremely changed the landscape in the sense that physicians are now not necessarily small groups, but could be one group in a very large umbrella. So there's been a lot of changes, which in turn has made the non-compete and market have different considerations than it previously did. Jill and Eric, in your experience, are there unique issues that arise out of that model that are different than the single practice model when it comes to litigating non-compete cases? The biggest change I've seen is we talk about geographic scope and also who you're, who you're prohibited from competing with. So whereas in the past, if you had a single practice in a very specific geographic area, you might have a restriction on competition within 5, 10, 20, 40 miles of that location. Now you're starting to see in some cases more traditional non-compete where you'd see with, with another type of business where it says you can't compete within X geographic area of any of our practices that are in this group. And so all of a sudden, instead of having 10 miles around, I don't know, Columbus, Ohio, you've got 10 miles around Columbus, 10 miles around Cleveland, and so forth, which makes things differently and frankly, likely less enforceable 
And even in other industries, you see that being less forceful. It's typically where the employee worked or spent the most of their time or had influence or managed other people. So that's not really different. It, the difference is seeing how, the, how they're drafted. And then the other issue is who the non-compete is with. You can have non-competes, of course, with the practice, but you can also have them with these management companies that Dan was talking about. And in those cases, there's reasons to do that. Certainly, especially if you have an ownership interest in the management company as well, the physician, especially in states that don't allow for non-competes against physicians from practicing medicine, you know, you could still prohibit them from participating in a management company type of thing. So the question is, who is the non-compete with? Are you prohibited from competing with the practice or are you prohibited from competing with the management company or both? And those are some unique issues that we've seen with this consolidation. And to Eric's point on that, in states that have corporate practice, physicians and others are going to be employed by the professional corporation. But Eric alluded to it. Oftentimes, there may be a more senior experienced physician that's not seeing patients on a day-to-day -day basis, but is engaged by the management company almost as an administrative capacity to kind of guide them in terms of the structure of the company and making sure that there's policies and procedures, quality controls in place that protect both the professional corporation as well as the management company. In that sense, there is a possibility that that person has a, a restrictive covenant in place between them and the management company that gives the management company rights because oftentimes in the PCMSO world, and I use those terms meaning professional corporation or management services organization, if a physician is employed by the PC, the management company cannot directly try to enforce the non-compete that's in place between that physician and that PC. Those are two distinct entities, even though there may be some management arrangement in place, but that's the core of the corporate practice world is that there's a separation of the two entities. And I think Dan and Eric, you know, you both just mentioned you could have a non-compete that prohibits a physician from functioning in an administrative or advisory capacity. For example, as I, I talked about earlier, Colorado has a statute on the books that prohibits non-competes that restrict a physician's right to practice medicine. But that same non-compete that is going to prohibit them in the administrative context is going to be upheld and enforceable. So there's just a lot of unique issues around how those are structured in this context. Thank you to Eric, Jill, and Dan for joining today and for such a great discussion. A special thank you to our listeners. If you would like to subscribe to Spilling Secrets, please go to ebglaw.com forward slash subscribe and click the box for Trade Secrets and Non-Competes Spilling Secrets podcast series. And if you would like to download the new 50-state healthcare supplement to our 50-state non-compete survey, please go to resources.ebglaw.com forward slash 50-state non-compete survey for healthcare. Thanks again for joining. Until our next episode, this is Kate Rigby signing off on behalf of the Spilling Secrets team. This podcast is presented by Epstein, Becker & Green, PC. All rights are reserved. This audio recording includes information about legal issues and legal developments. Such materials are for informational purposes only and may not reflect the most current legal developments. These informational materials are not intended and should not be taken as legal advice on any particular set of facts or circumstances, and these materials are not a substitute for the advice of competent counsel. The content reflects the personal views and opinions of the participants. No attorney-client relationship has been created by this audio recording. This audio recording may be considered attorney advertising in some jurisdictions under the applicable law and ethical rules. The determination of the need for legal services and the choice of a lawyer are extremely important decisions and should not be based solely upon advertisements or self-proclaimed expertise. No representation is made that the quality of legal services to be performed is greater than the quality of legal services performed by other lawyers.